So folks, without further ado, let me welcome our guest today, Rob Smith, who, well, I'm going to let him introduce himself. So Rob, why don't you tell the people a little bit of what you've done as a living? Where have you worked and what have you done? My EIC roles start off with PC Gamer um, for years, then official Xbox magazine, then PlayStation magazine. Uh, they were all at Future. Then, um, yeah, I was a uh, EIC at Machinima for four years. Um, and then, yeah, I've been working, uh, I was working until a couple of months ago at EA in a quality analysis role. What does quality analysis mean at, at EA? It is a huge company, so I have no idea what half the people do there beyond they pump out lots and lots of video games. Yeah, basically it's, uh, you know, every game goes through many different processes of whether it's, you know, ideas, iterations, and obviously EA has all the annualized titles, all the sports games. Um, and so those are on, you know, it's no surprise that there's going to be another Madden next year um, or a FIFA. Um, but what goes into that, particularly with um, technology changes, console changes, and also sort of, you know, company direction changes, um, you know, what features are going to go in. And so as a result, we have uh, we, the external consultants are used to sort of come and get sort of fresh eyes on some of those ideas um and so um it was basically managing the uh the consultants that do that um there's also um a, a mock reviewer layer which a lot of people that used to be working in the press are, are sort of doing where you know it, they want to know uh, it's sort of expectation management okay um, so they want to get a sense of you know what is the press or the traditional sort of games media going to say about you know this particular game um so the, there are no real sort of surprises but also to sort of okay how can we make this better uh, uh so what was great about it was the you know there is a constant and um you know a real ongoing effort to to make the games um better to listen to uh feedback and i know that you know when you've got a, as you say a, a company the size of ea um it's very easy for, uh, you know, threads to go, oh, you know, they don't listen, they don't care, they don't do any of this. And that's, I, I know, patently untrue. <laughs> um, Doesn't stop uh, people from saying EA is the most evil company ever. Rah, 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 rah. Of, of course. And I mean, over the last few years, that certainly, uh, uh, that attitude has changed a lot. But then, uh, you know, I, I, I think, uh, you know, EA was the first internal game company that I worked for. Um, and so, um, you know, just sort of, understanding and appreciating the the commitment to actually you know making the games that players actually want to play um and and as i'm sure you're aware i mean with the sizes of teams these days making making games for AAA consoles these days is really 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 hard yeah um then throw in licenses whether it's with a fifa or an nfl or a uh, uh, Disney for LucasArts uh, uh, properties. Um, there's all kinds of things that that then go into it. And so I'm assuming because of your background with uh, the magazines and publications that you mentioned before, that is why um, Lucas Publishing, or I guess DK, I guess probably published it. Uh, it was uh, Chronicle. It was Chronicle, Chronicle books Chronicle. that yeah approached yeah. you for writing uh, Rogue Leaders' uh, story of LucasArts. Yeah, um, I actually, the, the editor at Chronicle Books, I'd actually, uh, he'd worked at uh, Future Publishing or uh, Imagine as it was in the day on one of the um, games news um, magazines that we uh, we put out. So I, I already knew him and uh, and he came to me and said, hey, uh, you know, what do you think of this idea? And so we started kicking around the ideas uh, for what the book could and, and should be. Um, and it, uh, it steamrolled pretty, pretty quickly into uh, starting to put it together. And you know, having I mean, seen the book, it's you know half art, half story. So it's like it's a good mix of, well, uh, since uh, we had him on a, the show a few weeks ago, what Jonathan Rinsley does with art books and with you know the making of Star Wars books, it's a good mix of both of his worlds as the editor for, for this uh, as far as the Lucas uh, Lucas film side goes. Yeah, it was definitely something that you know we wanted to be able to sort of delve into whatever archives we could uncover um, and get some of the. Um, I think that one area that gamers always seem to appreciate are the stories that they they don't get in a traditional sort of preview. Um, you know, those behind the scenes, um, you know, what ended up on the cutting room floor. Those are the kind of things, whether, you know, it's the same reason that, uh, you know, movie outtakes are so 
entertaining. Um, you know, there, there is an awful lot that went into every single game, and you can go back to the very first games they they made um, all the way through, and there, there are stories involved. So we wanted to um, to match a narrative to the uh, to the artwork that we could uh, produce. Um, and, and sort of within that, the early days, uh, you know, there were fewer games and sort of more to discuss. Um, as Lucas Arts, as a uh, as a studio, developed and changed its um, changed its so sort of format from original titles, the Scum Engine, and those kind of things, into um, obviously going with the uh, with, with the Star Wars properties. Yeah, and in, in the early days, if I recall right, because you know I grew up playing Lucas Arts games and Sierra games, and in the nineties, it was Lucas Arts and Sierra were the big ones on PC because consoles where they were big, but they weren't. PC had its big place then, and you know, and we had the X-wing titles on these ones. And Lucas Arts, any I mean, any time Lucas Arts had their name on a game, people would pay attention. Now, regardless if that game was really good or not, but pe people would pay attention, and it it ha seemed to be that way even until they, I guess they're still roundish, but they're not at the same time. Um, you know, until the end, Lucas Arts had a name, and people would pay attention, and whether the and they had great expectations for each of those e each title that came out because of the what happened at the very beginning in the 80s and 90s with the early titles. Yeah, that, I think that's completely true. The uh, When you were looking at sort of the, the developers or the studios at the time, um, any game that had that uh, Lucas name on it, it was always going to generate uh, interest. But uh, uh, I think it's really interesting that they really made the, uh, a name for the studio without Star Wars. Uh, they made the name for the studio on the back of you know the maniac mansions the um and monkey island games and you know the the scum um adventure uh games that were inventive um they were funny they were just superbly written um and they really uh grasped an audience at the time that was uh was really getting a hold of that kind of um uh content and as you say sierra with its king's quest police quest and uh, and those games and then evolving into gabriel knight you know they uh sierra took advantage of emerging cd-rom technology with those kind of uh the gabriel knight games and things just as um you know uh, lucasville managed to do with rebel assault and managed to sell as many cd drives just because people wanted to see this amazing new graphics thing so you know they were pushing technology um under the hood um while they were um also creating these sort of unique game worlds the characters guy brush you know the day of the tentacle characters sam and max that kind of thing um you know they were making a name in, in a lot of different ways they had the technologies with whether it was the Scum Engine um, or iMuse for the music, and they, these were all kind of revolutionary things that they they were actually working on. Uh, even going back to the the early days of um, you know the, the very first games and saying to uh, ILM engineers, how do we make that thing that you're showing on the screen there happening with this power? Uh, and trying to use the engineers to um, uh, to revolutionize at the time what you could get out of what the, were really very rudimentary graphics cards. Yeah, I remember the first time I played, so it was the first LucasArts game that really blew me. I think it was TIE Fighter. Really right. blew me away with, you know, like even since, since TIE Fighter and those series went away, I haven't played a flight sim quite like it. They've, I've never seen one that reacts the same. Rainbow Rogue Squadron is not the same. Battlefront's not the same. It's just there's just something about those early games that they knew the feel of the type of stuff they wanted and they really made something new every single time, be it Dark Forces, which was I guess similar to Doom and Wolfenstein at the time, or you know, as you mentioned, like Sam and Max and those ones, which ironically a lot of LucasArts still lives on through Telltale games, which a lot of those people, if I recall right, came from LucasArts and came from those adventure titles. And that that company is just growing bigger than ever. Yeah, they they certainly Telltale certainly picked up that uh, that mantle largely because, as you say, a number of the people that uh, that founded Telltale were were part of that um, uh, the the group that were making the uh, Day of the Tentacles and those kind of games, and that's why they you know being able to see them uh, you know Monkey Island has been released again on you know was it Xbox three hundred and sixty and um, you know these games have come out on uh, uh, you know PC downloads in in redone Grim Fandango was recently um, redone done to to much acclaim because you know it's a, a very sort of quirky subject matter um yet the game is is fantastic um probably didn't have quite the commercial appeal that uh uh 
it deserved as a game. But, um, you know, the people that have played it again recently in the remastered version have said, oh, wow, you know, th this kind of gameplay is, it's not really being done today, um, you know, by a lot of other games. It's sort of more on the indie game sort of side where, um, you know, creators are trying to create those original style of, uh, of adventures that really do harken back to um, what LucasArts was doing really starting at the at the very beginning in the uh, early 80s. So you came in to write this book. The book came out in 2008. Yep. Um, and, you know, we all know that period from, let's see, like 2006-ish on was really rough for LucasArts. And then it just <laughs> got worse after your book, which there, I'm quite yep. sure there could be a second volume of that. Yeah. Um, I, I, it, when we were putting the book together, I mean, to be honest, uh, you know, the, the background of that was my original pitch was to uh, organize the book into sort of thematic sections. So there would be the early days, there would be the technology, uh, there would be the Star Wars and indie years, because, you know, there were, as you say, there were periods where there were a lot of products getting put out that had uh, the Star Wars stamp on them that were not of the, or even the LucasArts stamp on them, that were not of the quality that um everybody had been expecting on the back of the monkey islands um even like you say with dark forces and certainly you know a game like jedi knight was you know one of the most anticipated action games i can remember ever covering um and you know all of those games were critically acclaimed as well as being you know commercially successful um they also had was i don't know red rock racing or something i mean they had a bunch of uh that might not be the right name of the game. Um, but they had a bunch that were not the same level of quality. So within the book, um, you know, right at the beginning, working with Jonathan Barry, they said, okay, uh, we want to include every game. So, all right, well, that sort of impacts how the narrative, uh, you know, needs to get kind of condensed in the middle. Um, but also they were quite happy with, uh, you know, I, I made it very clear, as we all know, some of those games weren't that great. And, and um, you know, the LucasArts people, to their credit, were just like, tell the story. Um, and so with virtually, you know, there, there was virtually li uh, no sort of, I mean, there, there was no censorship or anything of, you know, saying anything bad. But as you say, you know, when the, when I, turned the book in uh my final manuscript in was actually the end of 2007 and it was right around that time um i'd uh just finishing uh, finished sort of interviewing the uh the the existing uh president of the company at the time um and in the process of editing he was uh he was let go and another guy came in and so yeah that there is a uh you know i i think it could certainly do with another chapter which i would love to do um, I've talked to Barry, but there's sort of certain um, uh, licensing issues involved in that um, because you know um, the the company went through uh, very difficult times as it tried to identify itself within a much much bigger organization, which was Lucasfilm and which was ultimately Disney. Um, and even uh, there are certain sort of parallels you can see with what Disney has done with its own interactive division where, you know, it would start up its own internal uh, production uh, of games and then say, oh, no, 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 we're not going to do that anymore. We're just going to license it out. And then a few years later go, hey, why aren't we doing this ourselves? Let's do this. And oh, no, 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 let's go back again and just license it out. Um, and I think that that's uh, a little bit of what had happened with, uh, um, with the Lucas... Um, uh, titles because I mean there was obviously that point in history when um, basically the the Lucasfilms uh, or LucasArts said we have this great property why don't we do an action game who are the best action game developers currently out there well you know Raven's pretty good let's let's talk to them about a Star Wars game well what about um, a, uh, an RPG well, those Bioware guys seem to know the RPG space. Let's give the license to them. And with a, an MMO, Sony Online was totally dominating with uh, with EverQuest. Let's give uh, those guys the keys to the Star Wars kingdom, and uh, you know we end up with uh, with Galaxies. So they really sort of went about trying to make, you know take the license, give it to the uh, you know some of the the best developers who. You know, everybody knows every single one of the guys on those teams will have been over the moon to suddenly be told, hey, we're going to do a Star Wars game. 
Uh, we've just been handed the keys to that particular kingdom to do what we can um, and really try and make high quality games. And that's how we got Knights of the Old Republic and, uh, you know, the ongoing um, sort of Jedi Knight or uh, Jedi Academy uh, games and, uh, and galaxies. And, you know, that's just so people can understand from the time your book was written, you know, titles that came out. I'm quite sure there's so many stories. You cover some of them in your book. But there's so many stories like, you know, Star Wars The Force Unleashed 2 came out. There's, there's, there's entire books can be written about with that. You have yep. uh, KOTOR 2, The Sith Lords. You have uh, The Old Republic was announced 2008, came out 2011. You have Clone Wars Republic Heroes. You have Monkey Island came back with Telltale. You have uh, Lego Star Wars. You have uh, yep. 1313, of course, Connect Star Wars, <laughs> Angry Birds Star Wars. There's a lot of stuff that was coming out. And, uh, you know, the, some to a high degree and some are not. But... Um, but from what I understand, the company was just such a mess by then that there's there wasn't much they could do, and they and people will do think that LucasArts is dead, but it's technically still around with like ten people, and they do licensing. Yeah, I mean, obviously there are Star Wars games, and they need to be managed uh, internally. I mean, you know, I think it it was it was a couple of years after, or a year or so after um, the book came out that uh, there were there was internal development still going on um, on secret projects inside uh, LucasArts, so internal teams working inside uh, LucasArts to, to create games that um, ultimately got canned, but they uh, they involved uh, meetings with uh, George about the uh, storylines and all those kind of things. So, um, you know, aside from um, Force Unleashed, um, there, there was still internal development going on really until the end when they finally said, okay, well, we're not going to do any of this, which I think is a real shame. I mean, I, I would have loved to have, uh, uh, have seen, you know, what they could do internally, but I think that there was always a, a challenge of what the size of the business was in comparison to the, uh, the bigger question of the size of the Lucasfilm business. Um, I think that there was probably always a sense that, um, it was kind of stuck out on its own in its own little silo, um, and as much as you know, everybody in the video game industry can cite you know numbers and the size of video game revenue outstripping Hollywood and that kind of thing. Obviously, the um, you know the buzz and awareness over movies is a slightly bigger deal, and obviously you know the TV shows and all those kind of things that have now uh, sprung up have uh, have really taken prominence over the the complexities of you know producing. Um, high high level AAA games, which you know now involve teams of you know at least two hundred people, and you know uh, extended development teams, uh, you know in the several hundreds. And you know this, and, and at the end, you know the last the last game that people remember from LucasArts. I, mean, I think the last game was Angry Star Wars, but the last one people remembered was thirteen thirteen, which was a yeah. kind of a marriage between ILM, Skywalker Sound, LucasArts. It was supposed to be a combination of basically all of Lucasfilm working together on a game. Yep. And I know there was drama about that one, like George Lucas causing changes, and you know eventually fell apart. Which the framework might show up again in the future. Um, <laughs> Well, yeah. I mean, you know, as, uh, as has been reported, uh, there is uh, a game in development that might have some uh, thematic uh, similarities. Uh, similarities to it. <laughs> well, uh, no, I mean, uh, as you know, um, uh, Amy Hennig, who was the um, uh, creative lead on uh, uh, the Uncharted series. At Naughty Dog um, is now at has been at EA for a couple of years now working on a on a game. Um, they, they you know n nothing's been specifically revealed about that, um, but you know obviously there's another game. Uh, if you look at sort of Amy's um, background and history, you can probably uh, have a guess of what kind of uh, sort of style and format it, uh, it might take. Definitely not. He, he tries to say dancing around. <laughs> <laughs> Anything that I may have, uh, have seen, not be able to talk about. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, so this question: When you came in there, um, I know at that time uh, Jim Ward was president, and yep. Lucas Arch was going through changes. It was a bit messy. He was trying to simplify things. How easy was it to get access to the art and the stories of these games that you were trying to dig into, especially some of the really old ones? Well, that was, uh, the, the, there's on the one hand, I mean, the access was great. It was, uh, you know, we made a couple of uh, appointments to go in. There is a, there was a room um, 
LucasArts had recently moved into its new uh, facility in the Presidio in uh, in San Francisco, uh, from uh, its where it had sort of been founded and based uh, in, in Marin, north of the city, and. Uh, the tragedy uh, for me is that uh, in that move, um, as happens with big office moves, an awful lot of things get looked at and say, well, why do we need this? And they get thrown out. So I've no idea exactly what was lost in that, but I am um, having seen what was available. Um, uh, you know, I was able to, to go through and we were able to sort of pick uh, elements of, of artwork, of, um, you know, uh, some storyboards, uh, letters, you know, some of the things that had been kept from the archives. And, and the access was, I mean, the, you know, the, the Lucas people were, were great in allowing us to, to use that. There was not a single uh, piece, I don't think, that we said, hey, we'd love to use this and there was any problem with. Um, we also, uh, I was also able in the interviews with a lot of the principals who were involved at the time, uh, some of those guys had, um, you know, their, their initial concepts or original scripts and those kind of things. Uh, and so they provided some of those um, uh, pieces for us that they just sort of kept as part of their own um, sort of history with the company. So, um, you know, it was going through a, a few different areas. Um, I, I, and curiously, what I mean, one of the ones that stands out is the very last two pages of the book. Uh, or an appendix of uh, of logos that had been created for uh, potential video games that never got made. Um, and every now and again, somebody will uh, discover this um, and post it on Reddit, and the book goes, you know, suddenly starts, you know, spiking, and I start getting emails about it. Um, and it, it particularly happened because one of the logos um, in, in the book was uh, a Star Wars Episode Seven, and this was a somebody posted it on Reddit before uh, Force Awakens was announced as the title uh, because the episode seven logo in the uh, that we show in the book is uh, called Shadows of the Sith. Uh, and so there was, you know, it sort of generated, it kind of regenerated a, a lot of interest in, um, in, in what had gone on with Lucas in general and, uh, uh, and the kinds of games that they've been looking at, um, you know, that they're, there isn't a uh, a Rogue One in those uh, titles, but there there's you know Star Wars Vader, Star Wars Han Solo, um, so uh, and a few others. Um, Star Wars Smuggler uh, was actually in development. Um, that were all sort of different ones that um, had been kicked around internally, but then um, ended up on the uh, on the cutting room floor. I find it surprising that they throw out some stuff because, you know, knowing from what I know from Lucasfilm, they tend to save everything in that archive. There's there's so much there, but LucasArts yeah. just seems to be like the stepchild that they sometimes like, sometimes pay attention to, but and occasionally George Lucas would show up and say, change this game. But it doesn't seem like they, they protected it as much as they did, say, Lucasfilm and some other other projects. I mean, maybe that's the case, but what I will say, and I think that this is uh, this is relevant, is uh, some of my original source material, at some point... Um, uh, apparently, uh, Lucas said, "Okay, we need to document, um, you know, some of the, the the stories behind where the Lucas Arts, um, uh, well, really, where the Lucas Arts story came from. Who were the people involved?" And so he commissioned somebody to interview uh, a number of the principals that were involved, as uh, like the early president of the company, Gary Winnick, and others, and some of the uh, other senior executives. And so I, uh, these um, uh, interviews were were conducted. They were transcribed, and they sat on a computer somewhere until I came asking about sort of you know past history. And somebody said, "Oh, I think I saw a thing." Um, and it turned out there were, there must have been, I think, between the six or seven people that um, were interviewed for this, uh, it was over three hundred thousand words of transcript. Um, that I, I, yeah, so it was like reading a whole bunch of books or an encyclopedia to go through um, and, and pick out some of those. And, and so obviously some of that information was, you know, it, it was a little um, clearer in, in, and closer in time um, because it's amazing, even though we're only talking sort of, you know, 30 so, uh, some years, how uh, different people's memories of exactly the same situation can be interpreted in different ways. <laughs> Um, so, you know, I, I, I see one, uh, one story 
Um, I'd contact the people involved to say, hey, I read about this. What was the background to it? And they'd say, oh, that didn't happen. Uh, okay, well, this person thinks it did. <laughs> and the other person goes, oh, no, 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 that totally happened. I totally had that conversation. So, um, you know, that that's just part of the, uh, uh, I suppose, the oral tradition. Wow. So um, I just want to start with a couple of listener questions. Um, this first one, I guess, is a pretty good way to start. I just want to know, as a writer um, or a you know, person who works with publications who talks about video games, what were some of the things that surprised you most when you started digging into the story of LucasArts that you were unaware of, um, the type of things that you were unaware of from working from the publisher side of things? Right. Um, I think that uh, one of the things was really about those early days. I mean, you know, I, I go back, you know, my first job in video game magazines was 1993, writing about Game Boy games. So, you know, that that that's a fair way back, but it's not back to 1982 when the company started and people were writing about them then. And I think that one of the most interesting things was um, understanding what the challenges were of a of a company that was just starting at that time when it was literally just you know, a handful of people sat in a room saying, okay, how do we make this thing go? And what are we going to make it go do? Um, and when you had that sort of rudimentary uh, technology, but you know, making a um, game like uh, Ball Blazer or, um, uh, you know, the, of the you know, first couple of games that they, they were doing, um, it was, you know, coming up with those ideas. And then as they, uh, you know, I thought it was really interesting to try and get that that story of how did some of the people like Ron Gilbert and Tim Schafer, who became so synonymous with the LucasArts brand through the uh, uh, the Scum Engine, um, you know, it was really about sort of you know how they came in. I mean, there's a, there's a story in the book about uh, Tim Schafer's interview at LucasArts um, where he says, "Oh yeah, I'm a big fan of." And he names the game, uh, and the person interviewing him say, "Oh, so you play you played that, did you? Well, uh, did you know that that's the name of the pirated version of the game?" So he was <laughs> in the interview and basically fessed up to the fact that yeah, he played it, but he he played it uh, from the pirated version. Um, didn't stop him getting the job, fortunately, which was uh, uh, which was good. But I think that you know it, it seemed so much more. Uh, you know, personal because the stories were so much, uh, there, there were so m many f sort of fewer people involved. You know, the teams are smaller. Um, and so it was a little more, I think, pointed. I mean, today, you know, when you're writing about video games for a big, you know, a, a magazine or whatever today, you know, you're still working a very uh, plotted PR path in general. Um, and I know a lot of the, the sites, uh, you know, these days, you know, try to, push um you know their, their sort of journalistic credentials a little further by by digging deep but at the end of the day there are pr people um you know in the room um the the people that are talking to the press are media trained um they know the talking points and which ones they can uh you know they can go over you know talking about things back in you know uh, from 1982 3 4 and uh you know the, these guys going to CES, there was very much less of that kind of uh, um, tracking. So they could say, hey, yeah, this is what we're doing. And, uh, and I think talk a little more freely. Wow. Yeah, I, I, I guess, yeah, that, that does make a lot of, a lot of sense. Um, so here's another listener question. It says, you know, one thing that frustrated me about LucasArts is LucasArts always seemed to be really good at imitating successful games with the Galactic Battlegrounds being Age of Empires, uh, Dark Forces being Doom, and so on. From what from your research, is this something intentional that they did, or is this just something that they get got kept on getting beat by other games beforehand when they were developing? I think I think it's something that they consciously did, um, because you know, in that you know, where they um, led the way on their own was in in the adventure category, um, and then to a certain degree with rebel assault they they were leading the charge with cd-rom technology and what you could do with that um you know the the filming of the scenes that were on uh, the full motion video scenes for rebel assault was the first time that there'd been any new live action star wars footage shot since uh, jedi had wrapped so 
you know, th those were sort of, you know, big deals. Um, but internally, you know, the, the graphic adventures and those kind of games that were uh, very popular with the people working at the company, the industry had started moving on into, you know, uh, full motion video, into the sort of first person shooter uh, realm. Obviously, the Dooms and Quake, oh, well, Quake and, uh, the, you know, those kind of games were, were really at the pinnacle. And so I think that they were very much uh, reactionary to the trends that were emerging. So that's why, as, as they said, you know, Galactic Battlegrounds came out of, okay, well, you know, we should have an RTS game. Uh, oh, we should have a, a shooter. Um, and yeah, I think that, uh, you know, Dark Forces was, you know, putting a, a Star Wars skin on a, um, on a Doom, Doom 2-ish type um, clone, which, is, which was fine. I mean, you know, the game was actually, you know, pretty good. But then, you know, when they did get to Jedi Knight 2, which was, um, you know, pushing that, they, they were able to um, take some of the emerging technology. I mean, you know, it was one of the first games on Microsoft Zone um, multiplayer, um, you know, connection to be able to, to play multiplayer, you know, lightsaber fighting, force pushing, for, uh, you know, force choking, all those kind of things. Um, so, you know, th those were elements that weren't in these other games. They were sort of inspired by. But obviously, you know, they took a, an awful long time. T to a certain degree, you could say that of even, you know, the X-Wing and the TIE Fighter games. They were flight sims in space. Um, you know, which had sort of already been done. And then, as mentioned earlier, that um, when Simon Jeffrey was uh, was president of the company, um, he said, okay, who's doing the best shooters? Who's doing the best RPGs? Who's doing the best MMOs? Let's give the uh, the license to those guys and, and let them uh, let them run with it. And they were all very, very successful. They were all, you know, um, I remember seeing Galaxies for the first time at uh, E3, uh, you know, and this sort of behind closed doors demo and everybody was just blown away. Of course, it took two and a half or more years after that first showing for it finally to come out. Um, but, you know, be, being able to sort of um, apply the, the Star Wars varnish to existing uh, popular genres, um, you know, did make sense. I, I think it did, you know, it, it was also a challenge for them to say, okay, well, what is our unique... Uh, value proposition in a world where um, the the graphic adventures on which they'd really built their name hadn't been so successful, um, and, and and clearly not all of the um, applications of the Star Wars to existing um, popular uh, genres didn't work. I mean, you look at um, Monsters of the Terrascazi, the uh, PlayStation beat 'em up, and that just made no sense at all. I mean, <laughs> no, it did not. <laughs> But that was obviously a, hey, people like beat-em-ups, why don't we have Luke fight Jotun? Uh, it was a silly idea, but anyway. Or Super uh, Bombad Racing. Right. right. <laughs> Pod racing I mean, worked fine, but Super Bombad Racing, not yeah. so much. Yeah, and, and uh, so I think that, that, you know, they did get absolutely caught in that, um, you know, following the, uh, the, the, the genre successes rather than leading the charge. Um, and, and I think that that's largely due to, you know, when you're dealing with a, a property and franchise the size of Star Wars, so many hoops have to be jumped through um, in that process that, you know, that I think that development just by its very nature cannot be nimble, um, you know, to, to get into, okay, we're going to make a shooter. Well, what does that mean? Are we, you know, there's all kinds of different elements of the politics or uh, of, you know, do you want to make it a, uh, you know, is it is it G-rated family fun or is it a shooter in the you know traditions of a a, a Doom or something? Um, and I think that there's just a lot more questions that have to be asked based on the franchise and based on the uh, you know, the you know just dealing with the Star Wars universe than uh, that doesn't allow them to be that nimble and say okay we're going to lead with this is what's going to be in the future because. Um, by the time that you know that development process has gone on, that that vogue may well have changed. Indeed, and you know, not all there. You know, a lot of people talk about how they imitate a lot, but you know, Star Wars Battlefront is Battlefield 1941. But at the same time, it was one of the most successful Lucas Arts games ever done, and you know, Dark Forces were really successful. Yep. I just think people just people focus too much on the ones that didn't work versus the ones that did. But yeah. One game that really did work for them was one at which we've touched on a little bit. You know, they gave Bioware the realms 
for Knights of the Republic. Um, mm -hmm. Originally, I believe it was supposed they were given the idea to make it either a, a Clone Wars game or back in the Old Republic, and they opted for Clone Wars after Attack of the Clones and stuff happened. Right. Um, so your book is one of the few ones that actually touches on the story of Kotor and Kotor Two, and and actually hints at some of the development of Kotor Three, which is ironic because uh, Kotor Two hadn't been out yet by the time you were that book was published. <laughs> um, but yours is the only book that talks about Kotor Three at all. Uh, there's really nothing else that talks about it beyond occasionally people still want it. Um, so this this is the listener question. I just want to know is it's your knowledge um, that you're allowed to talk about. Why did KOTOR 3 not happen the way it did? Was it because of the Old Republic happened and they made an MMO? Or is there something internally that just made it so KOTOR 3, either Obsidian or Bioware, whoever was working on that one, just couldn't do it? Um, I think that, I think what I can say of what, what I actually know, uh, know about it is, firstly, um, yeah, Old Republic were, became, you know, a big focus. Um, if, if Because Old Republic taking over from uh, Galaxies was going to be a big deal. Um, the, uh, with uh, Bioware, you know, making that at its studio in Austin and what, uh, what that meant, um, you know, it put a lot of resources there. Uh, Bioware itself um, was obviously, you know, was still operating, uh, you know, wanting to make its own games. It has another franchise that people seem to like quite a lot called mass effect um and Just so yeah so there's i I, th I think that you know from a development standpoint and just sort of talent to make these things happen because you know that this like i was mentioning earlier the size of these teams is is just immense and to do another game of that size dedicated in that way i think will be uh would be a, a significant challenge um that being said i mean you know Everybody, I think most gamers who played any of the KOTOR games will want to make sure that three happens. Um, you know, EA has opened another studio in uh, in Toronto under Jade Redmond, uh, Jade Raymond, uh, sorry, um, who uh, was obviously uh, became to prominence at uh, Ubisoft for Assassin's Creed. Um, and so, you know, maybe there's there's uh, you know something out of the studio that she's building. Um, and this is pure speculation on my part. I want to make that clear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think about what's. Uh... I understand that one. Yes. But but you know it's it's a game that I think that everybody would like to see. Um and you know for um for EA um you know having the license for uh for for ten years I'm I'm sure that that's um you know in discussion somewhere somehow. But you know and uh, to make a, a Kotor game um you know those those games are so big so complex. Um, you know, that's that's a 300-person uh, team. Do you think the Old Republic MMO, which is also, you know, Bioware Austin did that one, yep. do you think that yep. has kind of written them into a box for a KOTOR 3, or do you still think, since there's plenty of time, there's, there's lots of opportunity for a KOTOR 3 that they think they can just insert it just fine, because you know, Bio, Bioware's EA. Yeah. yeah. So they, they... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think that... Um, uh, I. I don't think that Old Republic has boxed them in at all. Um, you know, I think that there is plenty of space, and and as we know from, um, you know, what what Lucasfilm is doing with something like Rogue One, and not just following the episodes path, that there are the you know it is you know branching out into these expanded universe storylines. Uh, you know, even beyond where where the books and Clone Wars and um, rebels and you know each of these other things have gone so i, th I think that there's there's tons of opportunity uh with that um it wouldn't surprise me um if there was some uh storyline connection somehow with um with what's uh gone on with old republic and the expansions and that kind of thing um it, it being all bioware and it being all uh you know um sort of sort of within the same same scope um but what that would be i don't know and the the main thing is if it's not announced today um you're not going to see it for probably three years yeah if i remember older public was announced in like 2008 and it took three yeah four years to do it yeah and when it was announced it was probably in development for two years at that point yeah um but, but that's you know that that's how absolutely massive um the, you know those games are and, so, and certainly for something like old republic which really did try to 
do a few sort of u unique things in the MMO space to to make make the, that Star Wars setting work um, in a way that you know I, I think Galaxies uh, you know Galaxies did an admirable job sort of philosophically in trying to recreate the the universe um but the uh, uh, sort of underestimated um the desire for everybody to want to be a jedi <laughs> yes because by the end everyone was a jedi in my right. goodness <laughs> right I, and i i sort of like the idea that you know that i i liked philosophically the idea that uh it, you know in the original design um only a few people had that uh and you wouldn't know until a certain point um, but that's one of those sort of uh, idealistic um, game design tropes that, uh, you know, it, it's the kind of thing, it, it's almost like I, when I think about that story and, you know, I know some of the guys that uh, that were developing Galaxies in the in the early days and uh, it's almost like you can hear, it's the kind of thing you'd hear Peter Molyneux say, um, you know, he, in the way that he's so uh, so bullish about some sort of, you know, crazy ideas that you go, oh my God, that would be amazing. And then they never actually appear in the game. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, one question I have is in the early days, um, you know, in the 80s and 90s, LucasArts would make all sorts of games and it'd be a big Star Wars game every once in a while, but it, it wasn't focused on just Star Wars. And then they got to an era where it was pretty much Star Wars. Yep. And then they make a promise that they're going to do 50-50 non-Star Wars and games like Mercenaries or Outlaws or um, Gladius mm -hmm. would come out. Did it seem that there was sort of like an identity issue with it when it came to LucasArts as did they want to make Star Wars games or did they want to make every type of game? And it was just kind of balancing between what sold well and what didn't or in your yeah, research? I'm, yeah, they, they, they wanted to make, I mean, they wanted to be able to stand on their own two feet as a video a triple a video game publisher not a star wars game publisher um and, and in part that's also due to uh, you know as much as it might seem awesome to work on star wars games after you've worked for three years on a star wars game maybe though that team wants a change of pace um can they uh, you know just just go do something different for a while to sort of you know recharge coming back into whatever the next star wars thing is uh, and you know i think the couple of the you mentioned there i mean outlaws was actually a it was a pretty interesting game not far from perfect but you know who else was doing um western type games exactly who's still um, doing westerns now there's like one yeah <laughs> there's what game. red dead redemption and, yeah <laughs> and, and and you know so they were pushing uh you know to to try and be a balanced publisher because you know if one of those other properties uh takes off then you've got another string to your bow um but obviously you know the the uh rejuvenation i guess of uh, of star wars with the new movies and things just sort of makes everything lucas equal uh star wars now um i mean there's an awful lot of people um who don't know that uh, that are in this target demographic who are you know playing video games at you know 14 to 20 who probably never heard of um you know some of the uh, even monkey island or some of the early games uh that were being made um that were lucasfilm and uh, lucas arts and all part of this uh you know the story of of this this developer that became so prominent not just because of star wars and it seems that in their in their later years that outside of the force unleashed which is its own beast the games that really pushed the boundaries of what they could do were the ones that weren't Star Wars, like Gladius with the Activision in LucasArts, or, you know, as we said, Outlaws. And then Mercenaries, I recall, was a quite big, was a success too, as far as the critics. And they seem to be pushing more limits with these games that weren't Star Wars, probably because, at least to me, the, the little microscope wasn't zoned in so much on what they were doing and they could relax a little bit and just make what they wanted to make. Yeah, and, and I, I mean, at the end of the day, if you, if you want to sort of argue that they were putting the Star Wars skin on the shooter, well, you know, Outlaws was the Western skin on a shooter. So, uh, you know, what are the popular genres? Uh, you know, the open world uh, action game like, uh, you know, for, for Mercenaries, um, there were a few games uh, coming out around the time of Mercenaries that, you know, were going to sort of revolutionize that sort of big action genre that I suppose... Uh, you know, obviously the GTAs, but certainly even like Just Cause and those kind of games have have done so well at now. Um, but Mercenaries was definitely, uh, you know, in that category of a, a you know, critical success. Um, 
I'm just not sure. Uh, I'm not 100% sure exactly how commercially successful they were because when you, it's almost like, you know, a poor selling Star Wars game would probably be performing better than a, uh, a, a good selling uh, non Star Wars game. And when the bean counters look at those numbers, they'll say, well, why are we doing all this when we can, we can make a, a still try and make quality games. Um, you know, I, I, Force Unleashed, I think, did very, very well. Um, you know, still try and make uh, quality games like that and, and keep them in the Star Wars family, and that's what we'll focus on. And that's why um, it makes more sense to become a licensing uh, company than it does to, to have your own internal development. Amen to that. You know, I, I, I just remember Gladius being so much because it was, you know, it's a Roman gladiator yeah. title, which literally came out of nowhere. I believe it was on GameCube and Xbox. You know, yep. at the time when PS2 was dominating everyone. And I think it came out on PS2 eventually, but it was on GameCube and Xbox first. And I, it just came out of nowhere. And I, I remember seeing the title, like, LucasArts did this. This is just really surprising. Right. Well, I mean, there, there was a history, though, with uh, with Nintendo as well. I mean, uh, the first um, the first console game was, uh, was Star Wars on NES. Um, and LucasArts in its early days had... Uh, had a few relationships with um, Japanese-based companies. Actually, uh, JVC was basically the uh, the company that funded, um, or largely funded, um, some of the some of the early games that were made um, to release on JVC systems in in Japan. Um, but also to uh, you know their contribution basically minimized some of the risk that um, LucasArts as a uh, as, you know, trying to stand on its own two feet company he had as a uh, as a developer, um, and so you know there, there was this, uh, and obviously uh, when Super Nintendo came out and they were doing Super Star Wars and then particularly um, Empire Strikes Back, which was just a huge success. Um, you know, there, there was obviously this. You know, it proved that there was this existing relationship with working with uh, on Nintendo platforms and getting developers over there. Um, but they had other uh, things in uh, in Japan, and that actually, you know, one of my one of my favorite sort of uh, stories actually out of LucasArts was um, a project called Habitat, which was basically an MMO when the very first um, uh, modems were available. So this was on a Commodore sixty four with a three hundred board modem, um, but it was a a social media space. Um, it was sort of a, I don't know, a second life before second life. It was uh, uh, somewhere that, uh, you know, it, from a, a, a visionary standpoint, from a, um, a thought leadership standpoint, was, uh, you know, something that only uh, LucasArts was doing. Um, it didn't take off because of the lack of... Uh, lack of penetration of the, the 300 board modems on the Commodore 64, um, but you know, they got funding in uh, in Japan for it to run on a couple of the systems over there and uh, uh, and really try and, you know, push a technology that wasn't Star Wars, wasn't um, uh, any kind of Lucasfilm property, but was looking at what the technology was going to start to allow people to do, which was connect online, have an, uh, an, an avatar. Because um, I, I believe that Habitat is the first time that the word avatar is used to, for your represent you know with the graphical representation of your figure on screen so they they really did revolutionize in a lot of ways you know um uh, a sort of a trailblazing technology uh at a time when uh you know other developers weren't even thinking about it if i recall right habitat became club Curry bay yep and then it became worlds away which i still think is still around isn't it you know uh, the last time I looked, it was, and that was a good few years ago. But yeah, I mean, it's it did, uh, yeah, it did evolve into a couple of different uh, different beasts, but built off that sort of uh, uh, that same notion of a uh, of a social hangout location, which you know, at the time, you know, that that being sort of mid eighties, uh, nobody was thinking about. And I recall right, LucasArts also did their own Nintendo Power version called the Adventurer. Which, of course, didn't last as long as Nintendo Power, even though Nintendo Power is now dead, too. But like they, sure. they, they did a lot of stuff to try to keep up with all the, the big boys and consoles as, as well. 
Yeah, I, I mean, you know, at the time, obviously, there were you know companies trying to sort of keep uh, keep everything in their family. Uh, that's how you maintain uh, your audience. That's how how you maintain customers by having that direct communication with them. Um, which, if you think about sort of how that's evolved today, with um, you know, every game developer having its own social media manager and communications person that is their their sort of you know Twitter person. Every company has that. Well, back before Twitter, it was called magazines and newsletters. Um, and LucasArts definitely uh, you know did its own uh, you know tried to have that conversation and have that relationship through through things like the Adventurer. I mean, Sierra had their own um, magazine as well in uh, around those sort of. Uh, uh, mid '90s times uh, called interaction, and it was the same kind of uh, concept. You could sort of talk about other games, but it was to to um, to sort of not push the agenda, but provide support and background and uh, other stories for for your existing audience. So here's a listener question as we begin to wrap yeah. things up. We said nowadays, when you think of video games, the biggest developers would be or publishers would be EA, Activision, Ubisoft, and Nintendo. Back in the 90s, it seemed that it was Nintendo, Sega, LucasArts, Sierra. Do you foresee perhaps LucasArts coming back into fashion again? LucasArts coming back as its own thing, uh, maybe after the 10 years of EA's development thing. But do you see LucasArts returning from to, to their glory, or at least some form of their former glory? I would be very surprised. Um, because I think that what it would require is having a multifaceted publishing strategy that was that meant it wasn't just Star Wars, it wasn't just Indiana Jones, it was um, creating these original titles. Um, and I, I, I would be surprised if uh, Disney had the appetite for taking that on, um, as it's proven with um, you know, obviously, uh, it's just shut down. Uh, Disney has just shut down um, a lot of the uh, the Marvel um, um, Marvel games. Uh, no, obviously, Marvel Disney games. Uh, Disney Infinity uh, closes down fully. Um, was it February next year? Um, so, and, and they their stated strategy is going to a licensing model. Um, that sounds very familiar. Um, as a result, I think that the you know, yeah, will you see Star Wars games? Well, yes, obviously, that you know, uh, EA has a 10 year license. Um, who knows what what will come after that? I mean, uh, it's still only uh, two, three years, well, was it three years into that? Uh, we've had Battlefront, um, there'll be no doubt others um over that uh, over that course um and then it it also kind of depends on the technology um you know what what's what's um uh the ps5 going to do or be or look like um will we actually have a set top box like we currently have um will everything just be streaming will will lucasarts just be like a tv channel um where you stream content whether it's video or interactive gaming of some sort um, I think that that's, uh, you know, with the way that uh, streaming services are going, um, whether uh, hard physical media is still a, still a thing, at, um, you know, seven years from now, I'd be very surprised. So I think, sadly, um, I think a, a return to the former glory is uh, um, unlikely, but a new glory could be found in, in what they what they do with um, you know, emerging technologies. What's going to happen with the VR technology that uh, you can apply to a Star Wars universe? That'd be pretty cool. Yeah. And this would be an awesome way to wrap up, but I did forget to ask one question that yeah. a listener did send me. They said, I've been a fan of LucasArts since Maniac Mansion and Loom, mm -hmm. and I was a huge fan of their X-Wing and TIE Fighter games, especially X-Wing versus TIE Fighter. And um, I don't recall seeing this in your book, but I just want to know is th did did flight simulators like those just go out go leave uh, go out of vogue or did is there a reason why they stopped making those those amazing games joystick and all um, on the PC? Yeah, I, I think it was. I think it's a vogue thing to be honest. Um, it's those games are, are really really complex at a at a high uh, at a high end, and therefore its potential audience is a lot smaller than. Um, 
uh, than companies are looking for for the kind of investment that it would require. And I think that if you look at the uh, the, the space battles as they are in Battlefront, that's more of the um, accessible anybody can play this kind of style of uh, of gaming that is more in vogue. Um, I was actually helping a friend clear out a whole bunch of uh, old PC games, and we came across uh, Falcon 4 by Microprose, and it's a three, 400-page manual that was uh, in a thick ring binder that came with it. Those things don't happen anymore. Um, and as much as, uh, you know, uh, you know, the, the, having the joystick there and uh, and flying the X wings and Tie fighters in uh, in those and judging your speeds and your shields and all those kind of things, th there was there was a moment in time for uh, for those that I I don't think is is really there right now. I mean, maybe some of the um, uh, the flight sims that are or the space sims that are uh, out or or developing, such as um, Elite Dangerous and um, Star Citizen, if that ever actually gets released, um, you know, some of those are, are that kind of uh, mantle of, uh, of. I mean, that's more space exploration really than than space combat. Um, but there are, you know, a couple of games out there that are sort of doing doing their own thing with that space combat, but they have to be done um, in a sort of more, I don't know, indie way because the you know, a, a, an Activision or an EA is probably unlikely to uh to green light a game with uh you know that says joystick required i mean they they weren't required in you know x-wing or whatever but obviously it's a much better experience um and i think that those uh the, there are some barriers to entry for a, a larger audience and and with the with the cost and expectations of um uh, you know what it requires to make one of those games now. I'd uh, I'd, I'd be surprised if there was something that was um, as as detailed and uh, uh, so, sort of that more expert level as uh, as X Wing. I mean, th those games were absolutely fantastic, and you know I think uh, you know if you play them today, you realize exactly what goes into um, all the missions and the moves and that kind of thing. But uh, you know that's why you know we. Maybe we'll have a, a another wing commander or something like that that would uh, that would do that. But there's uh, there's a few out there to 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 scratch the itch. They just don't have the Star Wars name. <laughs> Speaking of non Star Wars names, the one LucasArts game that I wish they'd remake now, even though it probably would not be politically correct, would be Afterlife. <laughs> Peter wow. Molyneux should do it, except not promise anything and make it like black and white, but actually you know fulfill everything that. It, yeah. Right. Afterlife was awesome. If people don't know this one, you, you basically the concept is you build. It's a sim game where you build your own heaven and hell. There's tons of jokes in there. I know there's like a Quentin Tarantino prison, and you different different people in hell. It's, it's it was a very tongue in cheek game, like like Monkey Island and those ones that LucasArts used to do, and I think it would be hilarious to do now. That would be great. Yeah, that that's one that um, uh, hasn't been done out of the archives. I, I haven't heard anything about a remake of that one, but uh, I wonder if it's even available on good old games or something like that. Yeah, GOG tends to have a lot of them. Um, yeah, it does. Yeah, and if some if that one pops up in a remake, I'd be so happy. Yeah, uh, well, I, I was surprised that they remade uh, Grim Fandango, um, but you know they did. So anything's possible. Anything's possible. I think that's a great place to wrap us up. Um, why don't you, uh, if people have any more questions for you or want to follow what your work, why don't you tell people what you're doing now? And uh, if they want to ask you any more questions, how they can get in contact with you or follow you on Twitter. Yeah, uh, my Twitter is uh, RobSmithUTB. Um, and uh, I'm RobertRobRoom.com. Fantastic. And uh, thank you so much for talking to us. And well, we'll see if the listeners want to have another talk because I know when it comes to Lucas Arts, there's well, your book was was big, and there's so many more that we could write about it. So that maybe we'll have another conversation in the future, talking more of uh, listener questions. Yeah, and any time. And yeah, if uh, any listeners want to uh, ask any questions, I'll uh, answer anything I can. Thank you so much, and enjoy the rest of your evening. I'm glad that we were able to uh, make this happen. Absolutely. Thank you very much indeed for the time. And uh, yeah, th thanks for thinking of it. I mean, uh, the book was a, a labor of love. I'm very proud of it. And it's been funny just sort of picking it up this last couple of days and flicking through it again. And it's like, yeah, there's some good stuff in there. There's a lot of good stuff in there. <laughs> it's a story that hasn't been told by anyone else. No one else has talked about the story of LucasArts until they died. And then all they did is talk about how they, you know, the end. And, yes. But the stories that you tell 
no one tells. Not even not even Lucas Arts people like David Collins and others who have been there a long time. You're the one who's told them, and it's really the best place to go. Rogue Leaders, the story of Lucas Arts. If you can find it, go get it. Yep. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank <laughs> you.